Okay, I hope to get all of us prepared for the Blessed Run Conference in July. Uh, so with that, one of the things I like to do in preparation is to get all of us into thinking mode. Now, um, most people that I've seen think direct. They think straight. They think from what they feel and what they see like everyone else do. They see things on the surface. They don't challenge assumptions till things doesn't work for them. Say, for instance, you earn a good living, you live in this system, you will not challenge the existing norm till one day you realize with all the money you have, all the comfort you have, you messed up in life, messed up in your family, messed up in health, and then you will start questioning what's the meaning of this life? What's the meaning of having a good degree, having so much money? Uh, what's the meaning of everything? Now, you will not be brought to that state of understanding if things doesn't work for you. So, as the word says, uh, the scripture is meant to teach us, to correct us, and to train us in righteousness. So, we want to be turned from the typical thinking so that we learn how to think biblically and sometimes paradoxically. So with that, today I'd like to approach the topic on freedom. Okay? Freedom is a big word. Uh, it's a word that the whole world believes and would even die for. You know? And I would say, you know, freedom is the ultimate value of our circular age now. We hear it in songs, we see it in the movies. It's what the human soul cravingly desires. And this world is pursuing freedom like never before, if you could see. Now, if you take a moment to think through all the technological advancement nowadays, it got to do with the freedom that everyone wants. You know, say for example, the AI, the cashless society, our ability to control robots, doing away with negligence, mistakes, now everything in automation, you know, it, it feels so convenient, so free, so easy, you know, it got to do with the freedom we want. Say, for instance, the GMO food, you know, why did human invent the GMO food? You know, it's not good and people are, are eating from it. Now, to curb food shortages, and so that we have the freedom to keep on consuming, you see. So, and the social media also, you know, giving the freedom to everyone to have free speech. Now, it's what the human race craves for. And you can have a glimpse of it from the technological side. And I'm on the social side where everyone lives together. Now, the human beings want to be free and civilized, so we talk about rights of all kinds. Now, human rights, women rights, child rights, labor rights, LGBT rights. You know, the crave for freedom has given birth to all the rights we have now. And even though human beings know it is impossible for everyone to have absolute freedom, but the pursuit of freedom is relentless with the human race. So the widely accepted idea about freedom is what the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor sums up today as the circular view of freedom. And now he says, let each person do their own thing and one shouldn't criticize the other's values because they have a right to live their own life as you do. The only sin, as what he said, which is not tolerated, is intolerance. Now, if you understand his view, no? his view of freedom, what he actually meant is to be a healthy and authentic human being means you are free to tread your own paths, follow your own desires, whether it is to engage in uh, same-sex marriage, abortion for family planning, spending money the way you like, posting your views on the internet, all without the interference of other people, as long as I do not harm the other persons beside me. No? Or if I don't deprive them of their freedom, I have the absolute right of freedom to be what I want to be and to do what I want to do. 
So anyone who goes against that kind of freedom is a tyrant. It's an authoritarian. It's a crime. You know what I mean? So if you don't understand what I'm saying, you know, to put in a nutshell, today's mainstream thinking about freedom is number one. Number one, freedom is the ultimate actualization of the human civilization. The human race believes that if I am smarter, if I'm the more intelligent species, I have the right to control everything. I have the freedom to decide what is right and what is wrong. That's what the human race believes now as freedom. And then number two, I can exercise freedom whichever I want it as long as I don't harm anyone. Okay? And then, so if anyone stops me or criticizes me from exercising that kind of freedom, that's a sin. That's a crime. Okay? That's a crime of intolerance. Now, that's the view of freedom of the modern era. And this has become like the mainstream thinking in this society. Or at least I would say increasingly. Right? But we want to go back to what the Bible says, you know, and as Christian, we need to go through some critical thinking about what is being so much believed by the secular world nowadays. So if we go to John chapter 8, can we go to John chapter 8? Are we there? Next slides. Are we at John chapter 8? Or did I not give the verse? If you have the Bible, you can turn with me. Sorry, I, I think I, I forgot to give the verse. John chapter 8, okay? If you have your handphones, okay, you can take it out now. Okay, John chapter 8, verse 31. John chapter 8, verse 31. We're going to read from verse 31 to 37. John chapter 8. Now, this is in Jesus' very own words. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching... You are really my disciples. Now, the disciples of Christ hold on to his teaching, okay? Then you will know the truth, because Jesus is the truth. What he said is the truth. And the truth will set you free. So apparently the Jews doesn't understand him, especially those in disbelief. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say we be set free? Are you with me? John chapter 8, verse 33. So the Jews, in retaliation, says, you know, we are not slaves of anyone. We are free. We have been free. Okay? And verse 34, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent, permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the Son, the Son apparently refers to himself, the Son of God, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So the Son has to set you free. You cannot be free by your own self if you are enslaved by sin. The Son has to set you free. I know you are Abraham's descendants. No, um, yet if, if you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. No. They help Abraham in high esteem because he's the father of faith, but they're ready to kill Jesus, who is the one that Abraham believes. Now, let's go back to when we're going to talk about the freedom. Now, the whole, whole thing about man being given freedom, it cannot start from analyzing or categorizing the different kinds of freedom or whether man has used freedom for good or bad, or we try to limit freedom by how much. You know, that's what the politicians are doing now. We have to go to the spiritual truth, what God says. Now, I agree, first of all, the world has done good things with freedom. For instance, we have abolished the slavery system because we have freedom, we value freedom. We have protected women and children from abuse because we value freedom. Now, I, I understand it's important to be free from abuse, but let's understand freedom from the truth of God first, all right? Now, the truth is, number one, the truth is, the sinful man does not have a free will. In what Jesus said, everyone who sins, or everyone who is in sin, 
is a slave to sin. He's a slave. Now, what I'm trying to tell you now, that's the number one critical point when we talk about freedom right from the spiritual sense. The sinful man does not have a free will. Now, he has a will, but it's not free because of sin. Now, you say, Pastor, hold on. You mean I don't have a free will? I seem so free. I'm free to stand up. I'm free to sit down. I'm free to get up from this century, you know, as you speak, you know. Yeah, you can do this by your will. But you are actually spiritually in bondage. You are free to exercise your will. But in exercising it, you must know you are not free from the dictation and the influence of sins. You get it? You get it? So because of, of that deep spiritual sins in us, with the freedom we have, number one, we will not choose God. And number two, we will never abide in His truth. That's what the Jews say. They, are, they, they want to kill Jesus. They want to silence the truth. He want, they want to silence Him. Why? They seem free, but you must know their freedom is corrupted, so to speak. It is self-sovereign. It's not God's sovereign. You understand that? Now, so I said, if God is not sovereign, no one will choose God. God intervened in our lives so that we chose Him. And but the sinful man himself doesn't have that kind of free will. So if we choose to exercise our freedom, I can tell you the sinful man, if he chooses to exercise his freedom, whether to do good or to do bad, it will be out of his own accord. Whatever he do, it, was never, it will never be done with a mind to glorify God and His goodness. So, because of our sinful nature, the ways of the world has an influence on the mind of the sinful man. So whatever the secular world believes about freedom and talks about freedom, you must know it didn't know true freedom at all. No doubt, you can hear someone say, I'm free to command, I'm free to speak and say what is right and what I think is right. Now you look at huma humanity, what humanity has done with their freedom. We have set slaves free, yes, we have protected women, children. Now you can say that, but we also twist it beyond recognition. If the freedom is left to us, absolutely. We always twist it beyond recognition. We always twist it for our own benefits and convenience. And if you look at history, history has always shown that when a race or a country is weak, poor, and oppressed, they always talk about freedom and equality. Do you realize that? But when it gets stronger, powerful, then you will see it will misuse its freedom. They will no longer talk about equality and freedom for all. History has shown that this is the case for the human race. I don't know whether you could see that, you know. I mean, some of you are teachers here, you know. Some of you. Quite a number of teachers here. Now, answer me with your own conscience, okay. Would you always fully and altruistically do things that totally benefit your student. <laughs> Can you answer me with your conscience? You know? Can you say that? Now, sometimes you choose to do certain things or not do certain things. You realize it could be for your own benefits or for your own convenience. Now, I'm not doubting your integrity. You understand what I'm saying? I'm talking about the sinful nature. I'm saying no one of us, okay, fully, altruistically, do things for the benefit of others. So it is a dangerous delusion to believe that a human freedom is sovereign and good, that it always leads to good outcomes. No. So if we pursue the circular view of freedom, as what we've said just now, then we will end up with something else other than freedom. And, then, and we no doubt have protected certain race, certain people, 
We also develop nuclear warheads. You know, we exercise our superiority over others, and we flex our masters. You know, and all you see this on the newspaper every day. That's why I said now one of the one of the most dreadful thing for a human being is to be given freedom, increasingly. Not with money, not with handphones not with fame, not with qualification, not with weapons, not with information, but freedom. Because when you talk about freedom, what is in everyone's mind and how it is going to progress without constraint is going to get dangerous. You now, you will start with the teenager saying, okay, I want freedom to go out with my friends and freedom to have fun and freedom to spend, freedom to buy, freedom to speak, freedom to surf the net. Now, the teenager always won his freedom. Now, and slowly, and slowly, the freedom to say whatever I want, to post anything on the internet, and to put my rights above others, and some even to serve pornography and all. You know, and there it goes. You see, this is the freedom. Now, so, it's not the internet. It's not the money. It's not the fame. It's... The freedom, you realize that eventually it always leads to that. And for the adults, you know, say adults are more rational. Now we want freedom for the good of mankind and we are pursuing something harmless. So we want the freedom to love, the freedom to work, the freedom to get married, freedom to have children. Now it seems pretty harmless, but when things go wrong, you will also exercise your freedom to hate, the freedom to divorce, the freedom to abort the baby because of family planning, and then freedom to feel nothing wrong at all. Uh, let's legislate all this and make this a norm in the society. You, you get what I mean? Now, that's the thing about freedom by the fallen man. So if we are a Bible-saturated Christian, we will know how dreadful, how heavy a responsibility to be given more and more freedom. And no human being should be given more and more freedom without certain constraint in place. Only God, who is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving, and all-holy, can have absolute freedom because He always do good. He always protect with His freedom. You get what I mean? And even for us, sinners, you know, as we said, even we have the intention to do good. You will know what Paul said. I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. So with freedom is concerned, I realize we always tend to overdo things, oversay certain things, overcommend, you know, overcriticize. And even if we are sinless, we are not all-knowing. We don't know everything to make the right judgment. We, we are not all-powerful to correct every wrong. You get what I mean? So when, when we human beings start talking about this freedom, to be what I want to be, to do what I like to do, there's nothing wrong. It feels fine. Now, we have to give it a second thought by going back to what the Bible says. So having said all this, does Christian believe in freedom and having freedom? Yes, of course, the answer is. But what kind of freedom? Now listen carefully. What kind of freedom now? What is the freedom that God has ordained to be given to the human race? Listen carefully. I'm going to cover four areas again. Number one, what is the freedom that God has ordained to be given to the human race? Number one, that is the freedom which God has freely given through His Son. Okay? Number one is that, right? The freedom that God has freely given through His Son. That is to be set free from sin through repentance. And that's what John 8.36 says, If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Now, with all the freedom we are talking about now, we need to first be set free from sin. Because we don't have free will. Why? Because we are in bondage of sin. And what sin is that? Listen carefully to what I'm saying. What sin is that? 
Is it the sin of greed? Is it the sin of lust? What sin is that? No, it's the sin that bound us to yield to our own sovereignty. The human being will always yield to his own sovereignty. It's the sin of Adam and Eve. And then eventually the whole human race, where they wanted full sovereignty over their whole life, they wanted their own choice to decide what is right and wrong, what is good and bad, and live their own lives. They believe what it seems to be good and tasted the forbidden fruit. So, if we are talking about the Christian freedom, the true freedom that God gives, it has to come through repentance and yielding our sovereignty to God through the Son, through the Son. And this is freedom in its roots. That's number one freedom. And so, all Christians who have been set free from condemnation, who have repented of their sins, now let me say, you have freedom at your roots, okay? Now, but let's move on from here. After this, after this, let's keep learning. What is a life of freedom in the Son? Now, Jesus spoke to those who believe in Him, right? You saw that John chapter 8. He said, those of you who hold on to my teachings, those of you who know the truth, the truth will set you free. Now, let me make you understand this. When Jesus said He sets us free. Now, being set free in, in Christ is not just symbolic. You're going to mean a lot of people approach Christianity as symbolism. You know, well, just do a sinner's prayer and then you are set free. Sinner's prayer, accept Jesus, then you will be free. Now, Christianity is not just that kind of symbolism. Christianity is life. Christianity, Jesus is life. So when He sets you free, He sets you free by giving you His teachings, His truth, so that you are truly free to live by the truth and be guided by the truth. You get what I mean? It's a great thing. It's a great freedom to come to the word of light and to be shown your shortcomings through the word of God. So you may be weak, you may be temperamental, you may harbor anger and grievances towards certain people at times. Sometimes you may be influenced by greed, lust or pride, but if you are willing to be corrected and be dealt with by the truth, you will always be free and you will always taste freedom. But you, Jesus said, you who have no room for my word, that is, you have no room for my truth, you are ready to kill me, you are ready to silent me, and even as the world value its own freedom, they are always ready to silence the Christian truth. Don't you realize that, my brethren? Have you seen this? The world will always agree with you if what you said about your Christian truth fits their bill. If the Christian love that you talk about fits the kind of love they want, they will agree with you. If the love, Christian love you talk about, God's love that you talk about doesn't fit what they want, it offends them, they will go against you. You get what I mean? And now, so, my dear brethren, you know, if, if you don't talk about freedom, First of all, as a true Christian who's been set free, first you acknowledge the truth of God. Even though sometimes you don't feel you are able to do it. Acknowledge it first. Okay, acknowledge it. And second, be bold to speak it and lift it. You get what I mean? Now, then you are truly free and you and will enjoy that freedom in Christ. That's number two, okay? Uh, are you with me? Okay? So number one, what did I say? You go back, number one, the Son must set you free from sin. Okay? And number two, the freedom in Christ's teachings and His truth. And number three, what else does the Bible talk about with regards to freedom? Num number three, okay? Number three, I'll show you a verse in 1 Corinthians 6.12. 1 Corinthians 6.12, now read this. I have the right, that's what the words of the Apostle, I have the right to do anything, you say. 
But not everything is beneficial. Now, if you just look at the word, the right, it appears two times. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Now, look at this verse. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, again, but I will not be mastered by anything. Now, the Bible brings us to, to a real understanding of freedom here again. The freedom that is in Christ, which is something very less taught in the church nowadays. Now, over here, Paul was talking about the freedom he has now and the freedom he is enjoying. Now, as a born-again believer, he has been set free from sin, right? He has been set free from the law. He has been set free from condemnation. He has been set free from, from observing the Jewish ritual. He has the right to eat anything, kosher or not kosher. He's fine with it, okay? He has the right to get married. He has the right to live a comfortable life. But somehow, he, he considered the fact whether it's beneficial or not. Whether it's beneficial to himself, whether it's beneficial to the church or the people around him. So now, for instance, let's apply this. If a believer wants to, wants to buy a big house, a big car, you know, an expensive handbag, wear branded clothes, you know, no, I can't stop you. I can't say that's materialistic. No, that's legalistic, okay? Uh, I don't do that, okay? <laughs> no, if a believer you know, wish to post anything on the internet, right? he has the right to command to criticize about certain things that he thinks is right, you know, or to show how happy he is on the internet, you know, everything that he's enjoying life, you know, I can't say it's showing off, no, I can't say that. I can't say, but, but the word of God here wants us to have a good check on our freedom in those cases. And there's two ways you're going to check, two ways, okay? Number one, is it beneficial? Does it benefit everyone around you? Does it exemplify your Christian joy and holiness? Now, that's number one, whether it's beneficial. And number two, are you mastered by it? Now, the word mastered. Are you mastered by, by your spending habits? Are you mastered by the comfort you want to have in life? Are you mastered by the opinions of others? Are you mustered? You know, to check your handphones, you know, all the time. Or to watch a drama series, you know. Are you mustered, you know? Mustered by it. Now, if you are mustered by something, you are not free. You know, that's what Paul says. I have the right to do anything, but I'm not mustered by it. Now, now my message is very simple. If you would just confirm it, what is the thing that is stealing your freedom away? Um, the direct, direct thinking would be, um, I don't have the right to own a handphone. I don't have the right to do... I, I cannot afford this something that I want. That's not losing freedom. But if you are mastered by it, your heart has no self-control over something, then you are not free. That's what the apostle says. You know, recently I was catching a Japanese drama series. Okay. Let's talk about something, you know, probably that, uh, that could resonate with all of us. Okay. Recently I, I'm, I was catching a Japanese drama series with my wife. You know, it's a very, very interesting drama with an unpredictable plot behind. You know. So we, we were watching every episode, you know. No. After every, every episode ended, you know the thing with drama is, after every episode ended, you feel like clicking the next episode. <laughs> okay? So, because it sets you in suspense, after every episode ends, you see? <laughs> so, um, so we, we even, sometimes, you know, it was so exciting, I even talked to my wife, hey, guess what's the plot for the next episode, you know? And then, they were so tempted to click on the next episode, I said, let's have some self-control. It's getting late. <laughs> you see? So, 
So I said, let's go. So it's getting late. Because we usually watch it after our children went to sleep, you know. So it's pretty late. So I said, okay, just one episode at a time. Okay, and then it's late, some self-control. Leave it for the next day. And then come the climax of the series. Then the Holy Week came. You know the Holy Week? <laughs> the Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday, okay? And then what happened is it was so tempting then. So I prayed and told my wife, you know, yeah. It's only left with two episodes, you know. She already finished it, you know. But then I decided, let's, let's do it after Easter Sunday, okay? Do it after Easter Sunday. And, uh, okay, so we got, we got busy over the weekends. And then after that, we watched it after Easter Sunday. Uh, it was satisfying. Uh, and not only that, and when you do that, and when I do that, I was empowered to serve the Lord with the power of freedom. Because in my heart, I know I am not mastered by anything. Now, that's the kind of freedom that I pray that all of us will yearn and eventually have. All right? And, oh, and number four, and very much alike to this third point, I would say, it is about the freedom of loving others as yourself. As Galatians chapter 5, 13 says, Galatians chapter 5, 13, can we show the verse? Now you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. As Christians, you are called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, see within ourselves. Who is the person we most love? Is it our wife, our husbands, our parents? No, it's me, myself and I. You know. It's the flesh that we wanted to satisfy so much. That is our deepest inclination. Yet, when, when we are called to be free in Christ, God encourages all of us to use this freedom to its maximum capacity. That is, you will come to a point where you willingly and humbly serve others and love others as yourself. Now, that is when you have used the freedom of Christ to its maximum capacity. We are all in the process of doing so. No one can do this perfectly. But that's what the law says. If you are truly free and you are enjoying that freedom to the maximum capacity, you will love others as yourself and you will serve others humbly. You know. So spirituality is not, by, it's not measured by you know, what kind of ministry you are doing and how many times you have read the Bible. Spirituality is, is measured by the way you use your freedom. If money, power, position, fame, and time is given you and at your liberty to use them, would you actually use them to benefit yourself or just your own family members? Or you will use it to benefit others, the weaker ones, the underprivileged, the neglected ones. No, that, that is spirituality. That is spirituality in Christ. It's measured by that, you know. So... That ends my point too, okay? So, it's a, it's a mouthful, but I think um, I want us to really know what is freedom from the truth of God, okay? And what is freedom in Christ. And number three, okay, number three, I want to give you some understanding about how the circular world today is using freedom to challenge Christianity and how we should not be deluded by the freedom advocated by them. Okay, I'm going to give you five points about what the world believes about freedom, and that is not the freedom that the Bible talks about. So it's very subtle. I want all of us to be careful. You know, when you're living in this world, sometimes you, you could be subtly bought over by the kind of values that the world had about freedom. Okay, so I'm going to give you five points. 
freedom is not one, two, three, four, five. Okay, freedom is not okay. Number one, and when you are with the world, with your friends, they can be very good people, very kind, um, very accommodating. No, we have no lack of that. You know, in in this world, no lack of human morality in this world. But be careful, you know, when they talk about freedom. Freedom is not advocating there is no creator and no cosmic order. You, you get what I mean? Now write this down. If you don't, that freedom is not advocating there is no creator and no cosmic order. Meaning, no God, no designer in this universe, no order, no truths, no moral behind this whole universe. Everything is just coincidental, you know. It just happened randomly, you know. The world was created, you know. That's what Darwin says. And then you don't see any God, you don't see angels, you know. Everything is science. It's just science, you know. So the world and its beliefs about freedom nowadays will always gives you that kind of hints, you know. Everything just happened randomly. We are free from the constraints and limits set by a so-called creator. You know, uh, it could be the world is just filled with energy. You know, the yin and the yang energy, or whichever. You know, and all. So, this is the most dangerous idea. You know, about the circular freedom, and it is subtly, I can tell you, subtly becoming the mainstream thinking of the society. So everyone, when you start to incline yourself to this kind of thinking, somehow you know you will be less concerned about consequences. Even if it's consequences, it's consequences to the law of the nation, or I will just answer to my own conscience. I don't have to answer to an external god or whichever. I can be what I want to be. I can do what I want to do. Okay. As long as I don't harm others. Now that's the thing. Now very dangerous thinking. No accountability to an external god. Just to my own conscience would do. And this is what the world is becoming when they talk about freedom. Okay, so so when we approach the TBRC, you know, everyone has to think. Now, what's wrong with this kind of thinking? Okay, I'm going to set all of you thinking when we go to the TBRC about this. Okay, mm, okay. Number two. Okay. Freedom is not, listen, freedom is not believing lesser constraint leads to self-empowerment and success. Now, that's what most of us believe. Don't you think so? Lesser constraint, no red tapes. Then you will lead to self-empowerment and success. This is an easy assumption. The artists believe that. You know, the businessman believes that. The social media believes that. Most economists believe that. You know, I study econs. Most economists, they believe free market and all. And the democratic society believes that. So there shouldn't be too much constraint, as it will hinder creativity. Uh, it will hinder self empowerment. You know, it feels true. Okay, it feels true. Now let me say first. Now let me say first. Personally, I don't <laughs> really like constraint. And limitation, also, okay. Personally, I, I do believe, okay. Listen, I do believe, to a certain extent, lesser constraints leads to creativity. That's why every time I ask Mickey to design any posters, you know, I will just, I will try not to constrain her. You know, I will just give her an idea. Okay, this is what I want, Mickey. You know, I will leave it to your creativity. Okay, I will just, I will just give her certain ideas, and of course. Some very broad parameters, <laughs> and then it's for her to work on it. But I think, listen, having said that, but I think it's misleading to think that self empowerment and success is hindered by lesser constraint. I would think. Listen carefully. Let's let's think. Okay, let's think deeper. Why do you think? People are not empowered. Why do you think people are met with failures? Is it because of constraint, or is it because of their own sinful desires? I would say it is greed. 
fear and pride that hinder self-empowerment, not constraint. Now, if you look at the way people do business, you look at businesses fail. The way businesses fail is because the businessman is greedy and lack of wisdom, not because of constraint. You look at, you look at the, the government, then you look at countries who, who, who fall. Now, I studied, I studied politics. I know government usually fail because of corruption and misuse of power. It has nothing to do, oh, this country failed because of red tapes. Or this country failed because of lack of democratic institution. No. They fail because of corruption and misuse of power. So, the, the world will always arrive at an easy assumption. Now, give freedom. Now, because no freedom, too much constraint, not empowered, everything fail, you know, business fail, everything. It's an easy assumption, okay? For me personally, okay, I think I will need certain constraints and parameters to do well. Why? Because you and I know we, are, we, we have a lazy nature, okay? So if you have a lazy nature, you need a schedule. You need some responsibility given you. Say, so for instance, for me, I have a number of meetings to lead. I'm inclined to randomness. I know, you know, I need to be accountable to, to my congregation or at least to my other overseers. And the other overseers or the food farmers need to be accountable to me also, you know. So, let me say, Josh, Joshua 1.8 says, listen carefully, if we, you're talking with the idea of what is success, what is prosperity, the way to be prosperous and successful, Joshua 1.8, is to meditate on the Word of God day and night. Meditate on the Word of God day and night. Learn His ways. Abide in His truth. Put to death the misdeeds of your body. Crucify your sinful nature on the self and then you will be prosperous and successful. Now, that's the Word of God, okay? So, let's think critically, okay? And then, number three, number three, freedom is not, listen, number three, freedom is not doing what is desirable all the time. Now, I think this one is very important. Freedom is not doing what is desirable all the time. Now, you won't take long to realize that a, that a life which is about doing what I like, doing only what I like, is near impossible. It doesn't exist. This kind of life doesn't exist. If you want to do something you like, say for instance, and you want to do it well, as a teacher, as a pastor, as an accountant, no, if you want to do something well, you know, I want to be free to preach, free to teach my student, and free to teach them well. Now, you know you have to sacrifice certain other freedom. You have to sacrifice other freedom, right? You want to be a good teacher, a good preacher. Probably you need to sacrifice your freedom to watch drama series. You know? and you've got to sacrifice certain of your time. You have to work hard on your expertise. So that's why I say, for people who think that I can just do anything I like and become successful, doing anything that is desirable to me and I could do it well, it doesn't exist in this world. It doesn't exist. So don't believe all these like MLM talks. You know, I just went to Sydney. You know, someone spoke to me about MLM again. Now this MLM thing, you know, there's this thing about you know, what financial freedom. This is the terminology they use. What freedom? What financial freedom? Is there financial freedom in ML? No. It's a fake news, I tell you, fake promise. Like this fake, fake promise where you don't have, have to do an eight to five job, all you need is a computer, and then you need my app, and then you just run it, and then the money roll in. This is fake news, I tell you, okay? Fake news. No such things. I never believe that you don't put effort in something. You don't put effort, you're not going to be successful. So you know, when, when you want to do something well and so freely, so productively, now you, you need a lot of time to train yourself in the expertise. Okay? You need to train yourself. If you want the freedom to have a good health and an alert mind, you know you need to sacrifice your freedom to eat junk food, right? You need to do that. You've got to exercise, you know. No. 
and force yourself to do so many a times. Sometimes you need to put away your handphone, the freedom of using it so freely, and then sleep early. You know. So freedom has a lot to do with self-control. It has a lot to do with self-control and learning how to exercise restraint and learning perseverance to a point self-control is, is no longer tormenting. It's easy. Then you will understand freedom. This is the case in this sinful world. Okay, This is the case. This is the practical freedom that, that you need to have in the sinful world. All right? And that day I was just reading what Paul was, uh, and how Paul was serving the Lord, you know, in Ephesians. Now he spoke to the Ephesians elders and he said, he know, you know how I serve you with tears and humility day and night from house to house. Now he spoke about that. I look at the way Paul exemplified the ways of Jesus and how he could say, we are free in Christ. Now I begin to understand, you know, we shouldn't have a false sense of serving the Lord. Sometimes when we serve the Lord, whether we are in administrative roles or in shepherding roles, pastoral roles, you know, there's a lot of freedom you have to give up in a way. You know, when there's a new friend, a newcomer, you know, you got to put away certain freedom of, you know, just keeping to yourself and those we are familiar with and then you got to engage and you got to minister now, these are realities, you know. But when you keep doing that, you will be anointed, okay? And then number four, freedom is not, okay? <laughs> I'm going a lot. Uh, number four, freedom is not having the full liberty to do what you want if you do not harm others. Now, I spoke about that just now. The, a lot of people who advocates circular, circular freedom would say, I didn't harm others, what's wrong? No. The question is, what is harm? How do you define harm? Now, many in the LGBT com community, now I'll, I'll come to LGBT issues okay, one day, okay? probably this month or next month. Okay? If you have Christians or friends who want to know about the LGBT stand and all what the Bible says, you can invite them this month. Or next one, I'll let you know, okay? But let me tell you that people in the LGBT community always say this. We didn't harm others what? What's wrong? <laughs> right? What's wrong? It's, we have the freedom to love. No? And it's only you Christians. You and your Christian requirements. And then you say we are wrong. So why impose your Christian requirements on us we are not believers of the Bible. Now, that's what the LGBT community says. You know? But we know, every time when the Bible disallows something, it doesn't have its repercussion straight away. It will have its repercussion over time. Over time. And there are a lot of research, okay, but the LGBT community will always you know, debate with this. But there are, there are doctors, again, okay, who, who spoke about the health risks of gay sex. And, and these are things that cause, you know, sexually transmitted disease. Now, people say heterosexual sex also cause that. Yes, okay, if you have many partners, you also have that kind of problem. But it's easier to get it, you know, with gay sex and all. And... And the LGBT will always argue otherwise. They will present counterfacts. They will say, these are psychological pressure by the heterosexual people. You know? And if you say, you know, when you're in LGBT lifestyle, you know, you'll be more promiscuous. And they will always say, you know, the men and the women who commit adultery will, always, will also be promiscuous. And, you know, and all these things, you know. So it's... Uh, it's a, it's a very big fight nowadays, you know, between the, the two groups. And, and I heard this, you know, that's, that's what the LGBT advocates tell me, you know, it's, it's you, the mainstream society, the church, that drives the gay community underground. 
And because of that, they have resort to unhealthy coping mechanism and engaging in promiscuous, promiscuous sex and, and all. You know. But I don't think so. But I don't think so. I think even if there is no shame by the society, the, the medical facts about the disease are there. The biological facts are there. There cannot be reproduction you know, between two of the same sex. And when we go against nature, there is simply nothing much to argue about. For the consequences will reveal itself over time. It will reveal itself. Okay? So these are things that... Um, we have to go through, okay? Probably when I'm on the subject itself, I'll talk more about it. But so when you say, I'm free to do what I, do, I can do, I'm free to do what I want to do because it doesn't harm others, you always go to the definition of harm. When you say harm, it doesn't harm. Does it, it doesn't harm your loved ones? Does it harm the society in the long run? Does it harm the human race? Or does it harm you, ultimately, physically, you know, and cause certain illness and sickness to people around, or yourself? Now, in, in the heat of the passion, you will not think about these things, okay? But every time, let me say, when the Bible disallows something, it will have its consequences shown over time, okay? That's all I have to say about this, okay? Let's, let's go on to the next one, okay? The next one is freedom is not, okay? Freedom is not about being self-sufficient. I own no people, anything. I live for myself. I spend my own money, you know. No, that's not freedom. Because God has created us to be relational beings. I cannot, I cannot be living in a palace or a big house, you know, enjoying my life, if my loved ones, if, some, if my parents are poor, if my brothers you know, doesn't have a house to live, I cannot because we are relational beings. We, our conscience tells us that. You know, we have to sacrifice for our loved ones. We cannot live individually and indifferently. But nowadays, people in the West can do that. You know, people in the East, you know, if, if you are wealthy, you, know, you will not have, have a a brother who is a beggar. You get what I mean? If you are Easterner. But if you are a Westerner, you know, you can be a CEO of a company and your brother can be a homeless and you're not pricked in your conscience. You know, that's the Western mindset, you know, in a certain way. And, and let, let me tell you that, okay, that is not freedom. That is not... The, the, the CEO can say, he doesn't earn a living. I don't own him anything. No, I don't think so, okay? We are relational beings. So judge for yourself what is freedom, okay? What is freedom? And especially when we are living in this community of faith, no, we, we cannot be living just for ourselves. And if some of us are suffering, we make sure. You know, we put them in our prayers. We care for them. Shower them with concern, you know. That's the instruction of the Lord, okay? So my brethren, think through. Think through, okay, and challenge the existing idea of circular freedom. I can tell you, the idea of freedom in this modern world is godless, it's antichrist, and uh, it has nothing to do with the freedom that the Bible spoke about. Okay, that's my conclusion, okay, but I like all of us to think critically through what I've said. Okay, so you will meet with this kind of challenge in this world, but how are you going to react to it? And, uh, and nowadays, uh, there's over, overload of information and, and the church doesn't seem to have answers to a lot of things. And be believers are kind of, you know, confused. And sometimes they can be corrupted by what the world readily believes. Amen. So number four, okay, I'm going to end with this very shortly, okay. I want all of us to learn to live the freedom exemplified by Christ, the Son of God. If we want to be free, we have to know freedom from the truth that He has given us and from the example He has shown us. Number one, okay? Number one, very quickly, just three points. We need to see that true freedom, as what is shown by Christ, is that we have to accept constraints in our lives. And when constraints come, let's not grumble. Work with them. 
work through them. Everything, every constraint is put there by our Creator for our good. Our Lord Jesus, He was constrained by time and space, right? So in a lot of ways, we are constrained also. You know, we need to serve the church, and we need to serve our family. There's a lot of constraint, time constraint. Now, work through that in you. And think through, okay? God has put those constraints and for your good, so as you work through it, test the goodness of God. And number two, sometimes, sometimes you must not always crave for the freedom to change the reality. Sometimes you have to accept the reality, accept the reality, and believe the good it will ultimately bring. Sometimes, okay? If you're given a job, God give you a job. God give you a certain looks. You know, you're average looking. Certain things you cannot change, okay? God has a process for you in your suffering. I've been praying, but I, I, I don't seem to get out of it. No, believe it's good. God never do anything wrong. Again, never. Believe it. Accept the reality. Accept the reality. Believing the good that it will ultimately bring. And let God show you his faithfulness and goodness. Okay? I always tell my kids, no? You need not be the richest, you need not be the smartest, you need not be one that has everything, you know. Just have the things that God gave you and enjoy it. Okay? That's all. Okay? Number three, and glorify God with what you have now, with the here and now. Glorif- everything is about glorifying God, testifying God, Walking with him and testifying him. No. That's all I have. Okay? This is what is shown to us by the Son. The Son has shown us that. And if you live in this, if you could live in this, that is freedom in Christ. And you will come to see that everything that you have in this world, you will lose it someday. Remember what I said last week? All the acquiring will result in losing someday. But if you live for God, if you live for Christ, you be sure, okay, at the end of it, God will not withhold any of His goodness from any one of us. So if the Son sets you free, the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Come, let's pray. Father, thank you for the words you've given us. And it's not an easy topic to, to understand. Because it's about the inclination of the heart. Yet, Lord, but if we think through and confirm deeper into us, we will know this is such a critical, trick, trick, critical truth that we need to know about freedom. Especially when the world is being corrupted again and again and increasingly towards the end. And uh, men are suffering because of of the rights they want to have over each other. And so, Lord, I pray, in the midst of this, you give answers to the church. You give your truth to the believers that they will lift up the truth and exemplify the freedom that you have given them. So, Lord, thank you so much. And pray that you speak to every one of us and let their words be applied in our lives. Lord, thank you so much. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.